Um, and now, before we begin taking your questions, I want to update you on our campaign. These live events are part of our annual fundraising campaign to raise $1 million by December 1st. Thank you to all who've already donated. We have raised $664,000. We still have $336,000 to raise. So we need to raise a little bit over $300,000 in the next 10 days so that UN Watch's vital activities can continue. We got some terrific donations today uh, in particular, so you know who you are. And thank you so much for your generous donations, whether you've given us $5 or $18,000. Wherever you are around the world, it makes a difference and really appreciate you participating in our work to help make this world a better place. Um, with that, I'm going to go to our Q&A. Um, it'll just be about 20 minutes, not more than that. And we've got some great questions. So first, uh, Frida asks, Hillel, why is it important to monitor the United Nations? Or in other words, why does the UN matter? Well, you know, it's a really good question. A lot of people that I speak to um, say, well, why are you wasting your time with UN Watch? Who cares about the UN? And I would say people tend to ask that in the United States, maybe in Israel, maybe in certain countries. Um, in most places around the world, people understand intuitively that what is said and done at the United Nations, whether we like it or not, matters. Because UN resolutions are translated into every language, they go around the globe, and they influence the hearts and minds of hundreds of millions of people. So like it or not, what is said and done at the United Nations matters. Now, does it mean that every UN decision and every UN resolution is so important? No. But uh, in general, UN re resolutions matter in different ways. A Security Council resolution can influence the way that uh, countries act on the ground in war and peace. When Israel uh, was fighting a war with Hezbollah in 2006, uh, Hezbollah had rained down thousands of rockets on Israel, and Israel tried to stop those rockets. Uh, Hezbollah had kidnapped Israeli soldiers, um, and the wars ended with a UN Security Council resolution. You know, that's when the great powers sat around the table, and a UN Security Council resolution helped hasten the end of the war. That was kind of the format, the venue, where um, a war and peace situation was resolved. So, um, UN Security Council resolutions can really matter. And in terms of the General Assembly, that is a, um, that is a body where, which is not binding. Um, and it's less, I'd say, less immediate influence on the ground. But UN General Assembly resolutions nevertheless provide international legitimacy. It's an imprimatur around the world. They have influence as well. If, if the UN General Assembly adopts a resolution criticizing a certain country, that is a way of saying the international community gave its opinion on something and countries really care when the United Nations makes a decision or gives its opinion. So these things do matter. Uh, Sarah in London asks, how does UN Watch monitor the United Nations? Could you please give us some examples? Well, UN Watch is working day and night to monitor the UN to see that it lives up to the principles of its charter. It is said that um, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance and UN Watch is eternally vigilant. And let me give you some examples of why we need to be eternally vigilant. You know, let's take China for an example. Many people know that China is one of the uh, rising superpowers in the world and that they're trying to uh, take control of many UN bodies and influence many UN bodies. And um, one, one place where that's happening is um, at the Human Rights Council. Uh, you know that China this year was elected to the Human Rights Council. It's now one of 47 nations on the Human Rights Council. Um, what you may not have known, or many people did not know, was that China recently joined a, um, uh, a UN subcommittee that selects human rights investigators. So um, this is a, a Human Rights Council group called the Consultative Group, and it selects um, human rights investigators on issues like um, arbitrary detention and extra um, uh, arbitrary detention and disappearances. So uh, China was uh, managed to get appointed to be one of five countries that chooses the experts for this for this um, for the Human Rights Council. So uh, this is the kind of thing where China gets enormous influence um, over the Human Rights Council and uh, many people don't even know about it, choosing human rights experts. 
And Sarah, where is, do you know if the AC is on? It is? Okay, thank you. Um, so this issue of China getting on this panel that enabled them to pick UN human rights experts, uh, most people around the world didn't know it. It was UN Watch that broke the story. They were, um, and it went viral. It was in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Reuters, and so forth. Now, um, that's one example. Another example of China is um, 50 UNHRC ambassadors, 50 ambassadors at the Human Rights Council praised China on Xinjiang. Okay, Xinjiang is the place where uh, one million Uyghurs were put into camps, Uyghur Muslims were put into camps, and it's one of the most horrific human rights abuses on the planet. And um, 50 ambassadors at the UN Human Rights Council signed a letter at the Human Rights Council praising China for its actions in Xinjiang, saying that it makes people happy, um, and so forth. Um, this was rather shocking. Um, UN Watch was the one that exposed that. I mentioned it at the Human Rights Council and on social media. So these are some examples of why UN Watch needs to monitor the UN. Uh, the fact that China is getting on this panel that selects the human rights investigators. The fact that UNHRC uh, ambassadors are praising China in official documents um, on the issue of the Uyghurs. Um, the fact that the World Health Organization has only nine goodwill ambassadors. And of those nine goodwill ambassadors, one of them is the first lady of China, who has a, she's married to the Chinese dictator. And uh, second of these goodwill ambassadors is James Chow, who is an anchorman uh, on Chinese television. He's actually born in the UK, but moved to China to be an anchorman on Chinese television and is a full-time Chinese propagandist. He got himself the position of goodwill ambassador uh, at the World Health Organization, and China knew what they were doing because when the coronavirus broke out, James Chow, using his WHO title, was spreading propaganda on how China is a victim and China is doing incredible work, and he would sign op-eds and be interviewed in the media, and it would say World Health Organization goodwill ambassador, even though this person, James Chow, is a full-time paid Chinese propagandist. It was UN Watch that exposed that. The story was covered in the Financial Times. A hundred human rights groups signed our appeal to protest that. So these are examples of how China is exercising malign influence at the UN, and it's only thanks to UN Watch that these, these things got exposed. Um, a few other countries I'll mention that who we, we monitor at the UN. Iran is another example. The Islamic Republic of Iran has one of the world's worst records on women's rights. Women from the age of, girls at the age of seven are obliged to uh, cover their hair with a hijab, a headscarf, and um, Iran is a place where there are child brides. Uh, girls have to get married between the age of 10 and 14. Uh, it was just on Twitter, um, a story on, that I tweeted on my Twitter account, you go to Hill and Oyer. I asked, uh, how is it that the amount of child brides has risen by thousands in recent years? And yet Iran was just elected this year to the UN Women's Rights Commission. I'm gonna say that again. The Islamic Republic of Iran, one of the world's most misogynistic regimes, was just elected to the UN's Women's Rights Commission. It was UN Watch that exposed this absurd action and it went around the world and uh, the world knew about it. Otherwise, this is, was one other outrage that would have just been buried because these things happen, are happening all the time at the UN and those who, the only one that is routinely exposing these injustices and trying to fight for justice, uh, sounding the alarm is UN Watch. Uh, we testify before parliaments around the world. We've testified before the, this year before the British Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. We've testified in the Canadian Senate, in the US Congress, House of Representatives, Senate, and other parliaments in South Africa in Norway and other places around the world. Because in the end of the day, it's the member states at the UN that have the vote and you need to convince the member states. So we need to get our countries to do the right thing. UN Watch also publishes a regular scorecard every year. We give countries points if they do the right thing and give them minus points if they do the wrong thing. I'll give you an example. The Human Rights Council every year passes resolutions saying that something called unilateral coercive measures, unilateral coercive measures is against international law. What do they mean? They're referring to sanctions. Sanctions by Western countries like the United States, Canada, Australia, European Union democracies against dictatorships like Zimbabwe, Russia, Syria, 
Iran, um, sanctions that are meant to protect human rights victims and to put pressure on the abusers, also on Venezuela. At the Human Rights Council, where China, Venezuela, Cuba, Libya, Pakistan are members of the Human Rights Council, they managed to pass a resolution saying that sanctions against dictatorships are a bad thing. And this is something that if victims in these countries, they side with us. They want sanctions against the regime, they want pressure on the regime, but the Human Rights Council said that sanctions on dictatorships is against international law. So that's an example of uh, when countries vote the wrong way on these things, it is UN Watch that has an annual scorecard putting pressure on them to do the right thing. So those are some examples of why we need to monitor the UN. All right, iMacChat37 asks, why are the world's worst abusers of human rights members of the UNHRC? How do they get elected? Very good question. Well, the reason that the world's worst dictators want to be on the Human Rights Council is because, goes back to the original question, why does the UN matter? The Human Rights Council, they don't have any armies. Stalin was told that the Pope was criticizing him, according to an anecdote, and Stalin responded by saying, the Pope? And how many divisions does he have, right? How many, how many military divisions does he have? How many tanks does he have? Stalin didn't care about the Pope. The Pope didn't have tanks. Well, in the end, the Soviet Union collapsed of its own weight. It lacked legitimacy um, in the year 1990, and um, you know, the, the Catholic Church is still there. So having tanks doesn't always get you there. The Human Rights Council does not have a military. They don't have a budget other than you know, paying for their own activities. So why would anyone care what happens at the UN or the Human Rights Council? It turns out though, my friends, that even the world's worst dictators, and I would say every country, cares about what is said and done at the UN, cares what is said and done uh, at the world's highest human rights body because it gives legitimacy. So particularly if your country is illegitimate, if you haven't been elected, if you're crushing your own people, and you go to sleep as the dictator knowing that your people know that you're an unelected dictator, an illegitimate dictator, you want UN human rights bodies to give you a false badge of legitimacy. So it is precisely, as the Israelis say, Dafka. It is precisely the wor world's worst dictators who want to be at the Human Rights Council to wear that false badge of legitimacy to say, we are champions of human rights. And so don't be surprised that the current members of the Human Rights Council, 68.1% are not democracies. 68.1% are not democracies. That includes I mentioned China, Russia, Cuba, Libya, Pakistan, Qatar, Venezuela, Mauritania, where they have slavery, Bolivia, terrible country. Uh, the list goes on. They want to be there to make sure that they don't get criticized, their friends don't get criticized, and so they can wear this false badge of international legitimacy. Um, how do they get elected? Okay, we know why they want to get elected. How do they get elected? After all, the criteria of the Human Rights Council established in Resolution 60-251 on March 15, 2006, reads as follows. Members, states who want to join the Human Rights Council should be elected based on their records of commitment to promoting and protecting human rights. It also says in Resolution 60-251 that countries that commit gross abuses can be removed from the Human Rights Council. So built in to the rules of the Human Rights Council, it said you're supposed to be, the, the, the rules of the council say that members, sh I'm quoting, shall uphold the highest standards of promoting and protecting human rights. So they have a duty to uphold the highest standards. So how do they manage to get elected? They're not supposed to be there, the world's worst dictators. They manage to get elected because despite the criteria, in the end it's a vote. It's a vote at the UN General Assembly and it's kind of a um, beauty contest, if you will. It's, it's a cynical political deal. Deals are made behind closed doors. In, in the last election, and many of them, there's not even uh, any competition. If the African group has four seats, there's only four candidates. Um, if uh, if uh, the Asian group has five seats, there's only five candidates. It's all sort of stitched up in advance, and there is no competition. Sometimes there's a little bit of competition, but political deals are done, and dictators trade things, uh, whether they trade votes, whether they give financial benefits, whether they trade oil, they use whatever they can to make sure they get elected. And so the fact is that despite the criteria that are built into the, the way of electing countries, they're ignored. And our own democracies, my country, Canada, Switzerland, France, the UK, Germany, the US, seldom uh, fight the uh, candidacies of dictators. They allow them to be elected and they say, well, every country is going to be elected. The Europeans will say everyone gets a chance. And the reality is the elections are failing. 
All the elections do is allow members to say, we got elected. I have a proposal, I published it in the Wall Street Journal about six months ago, saying if the elections will only be cynically abused by dictators and will not be um, you know, defended, the system, the integrity of the election system will not be vigorously defended by our democracies who could campaign against China and Pakistan. Uh, but if they don't do it, then I say scrap elections, get rid of the elections and do it like the General Assembly. General Assembly has a human rights committee. It's called the third committee. Every country is automatically a member. There's 193 members. You will never see North Korea or Syria or Iran say, look at me. I'm a member of the, UN, the UN's third committee on human rights because membership is automatic. So if the Human Rights Council is not going to enforce elections, let it be automatic and this will uh, at least deny dictators the false badge of international legitimacy. That is my proposal. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but that would be the logical thing. Next question, Mark in Zurich. And I think, Sarah, what do I have? About five minutes about? Ish, a bit more. Okay, try to go quickly if I can. Is there anything at the UN that evaluates the human rights records of member states? Well, there is a regular system to evaluate every country about once every four or five years. It's called universal periodic review. Every country gets reviewed once every five years and it sounds like it would be a good idea. Unfortunately, those doing the reviews are the fellow dictatorships. So when China is reviewed, Saudi Arabia takes the floor and says, China has such a great record. The next day, China got reviewed. Um, China got reviewed, Saudi Arabia praised China. When Saudi Arabia got reviewed, China praised Saudi Arabia. We call that a mutual praise society. So in theory, the UPR system reviews every country. Every country gets reviewed. The reality, 80% of the statements made during reviews are false praise. Countries will say, Iran, keep doing a great job. China, thumbs up, you're doing a great job. All right, I got five minutes left, so try to take as many as I can. So that is how human rights records are reviewed. There are some meaningful questions that are asked by a minority of countries, uh, and that's not a bad thing. And we organize side events when China gets reviewed or Saudi Arabia or Turkey. Um, so we're glad that the event happens, but sadly the content of the reviews themselves are often weak at best. Tiffany in Connecticut asks, is there some merit to think that by having these countries on the Human Rights Council, I guess the dictatorships, the human rights situation in their countries will improve by association? There is a myth. Whenever we report that dictatorships get elected and we fight it, I will hear leading journalists, I will hear diplomats, including the Vice President of the Human Rights Council from a leading country in the Netherlands that speaks Dutch, uh, I don't want to name names, said that it's good that all countries are there and every country gets their chance and, and the Swedish Foreign Minister, the former Swedish Foreign Minister, um, Margot Wallström said a few years ago, well, we, we couldn't have a Human Rights Council with just Finland and Sweden and, and we need all countries to be there and that's, that's where they'll learn and improve, she said, right, right? Like Vladimir Putin's Russia has been on the Human Rights Council for a decade and more. Has Vladimir Putin's Russia learned and improved or did they only crush more dissidents, poison more human rights defenders and invade more countries like Crimea and Georgia than ever before? And when China has been on the Human Rights Council for more than a decade, has China's Xi Jinping learned and improved on the Human Rights Council or have they only silenced more courageous people trying to sound the alarm on the coronavirus, herded more uh, Uyghur Muslims into camps, jailed more human rights activists like Yang Zhenli than ever before. So this notion that countries are going to learn and improve is ridiculous. I understand I only have a few minutes left. I'm going to go through a few more questions. Um, so the notion that, that dictators will learn and improve is nonsense. If there's a country that is, you know, trying to do better and is on the path to reform, there is an argument for that country that's making progress to pull them in and work with them if they're showing those intentions. But to elect the world's worst dictatorships, there is no justification. There never was. Apologists at the UN seek to uh, defend it because they are doing political deals and they're embarrassed about it. All right, a few more questions. What is a reliable source to track human rights abuses as an index value? Um, I don't know about index values. There are some scholars who do that, but certainly you can look at the group Freedom House has an annual survey called Freedom in the World. They give scores. Um, one to seven, if, if, uh, if that's still their, their, their metric. And that's a very good source, is Freedom House, Freedom in the World. Suzanne W. asks, what are the consequences of a good or bad resolution? Um, I, I really covered that before, I think. And Aviva Hadas asks, it seems like a club that has nominal power, but no enforcement. What power does the UN have? I answered that before. I said, um, the UN is influential, and countries know that. Caroline from Ennismore, Ontario asks, who appoints the UN experts? known as special rapporteurs. We know from UN Watch that they are often biased against Israel. 
Is this the case with other countries? The UN uh, experts are appointed by um, uh, the UN experts are appointed by um, by the Human Rights Council. Um, there's a group actually. It's the five members of the consultative group, which China was a member. They make the selection, and finally the Human Rights Council, with the president, makes the choices. The president nominates, and the council validates. Are there people who are problematic other than than some of the people we mentioned on Israel? I understand I only have one or two minutes left. Um, there are a number of experts who've been very problematic. I'll mention just a few. Uh, there was an expert special rapporteur at the Human Rights Council named Alfred de Zayas. He loved the Maduro regime. He's the only UN expert that Venezuela allowed to visit. He went to Venezuela. He said, it's wonderful here. Look how much food is on, on the supermarket shelves. This is an amazing country. So really shameless propaganda. Uh, he's someone who defended dictators. Uh, another person is a uh, Russian, um, sorry, Algerian, Idris Jazeri. I said he's Russian. I tell you, I made that mistake. He was the Algerian ambassador in Geneva. He was trying to silence and muzzle the UN human rights experts. And then when he retired a couple years later, the Human Rights Council made him an expert on unilateral coercive measures to defend regimes and to say that sanctions are against international law. We uncovered the fact that he got $50,000 from the Russian regime to support his mandate. I'm told my time is up, but I'm gonna do Two or three quick more questions, because I know people are watching. So sadly, there are numerous UN experts who are appointed who are problematic. The most recent one was um, the former head of Amnesty International, Irene Khan. She's someone who praised China a lot, and she just got appointed the UN freedom of expression expert, another problematic one. Three final last questions. Can you share your most memorable moments when monitoring the UN? Um, I won't have time on this one, but I'm going to hold that question for next time. Okay, that was from Dina HR, we'll hold that one. Um, Fanula in Dublin asks, what is your relationship with UN officials? Um, you know, it depends which, we have good relations with some of them, others really don't like the fact that we're holding them to account and they hate us. So I think those who have more integrity are willing to take criticism. Kofi Annan, you know, thanked us for being there and said he would take our word seriously. So we hope that UN experts are open to accountability. Certainly the head of UNRWA, um, whose name is Philippe Lazzarini, has been very hostile. And when we've complained about UNRWA promoting anti-Semitism, he said that we're doing political attacks against him. So that is a UN official who doesn't like us. Um, final question, and this will wrap it up. Hannah in Pennsylvania asks, what, if any, internal mechanisms does the UN have for checks and balances? In brief, the answer is zero, right? In the United States, in Canada, and other countries, you elect a legislature, if they do something bad, you have usually another legislative body, the Senate, the House of Lords, that can step in. You have a free press that will hold people to account. You have freedom of assembly that people can assemble. You have the judiciary, an independent judiciary that can strike down legislation that violates you know, the Constitution. The United Nations has none of these things. If the General Assembly does something terrible, sometimes a Security Council can you know, intervene, but it inherently, Human Rights Council, General Assembly, their decisions are basically final. There is no independent judiciary. Even if things violate the UN Charter, there is no one there to defend the UN Charter. It's only UN Watch. That is a great way to conclude, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I didn't get to all your questions, but I'll see if we can answer some of them in our next live session. Our next live session will be this Thursday um, at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 6 p.m. in Geneva, 7 p.m. in Jerusalem. That event will be titled Protecting Human Rights. So we'll be answering questions about the work that we do to help human rights dissidents around the world. You can already get your questions ready for that. And if I'm able to, and if it fits, I'll answer some of the questions that I couldn't get to today. Or I'll do it just on my live on Instagram, on my, uh, on my story. You can look at my Instagram story. I'll try to answer them there. Um, if you haven't already, these live sessions are part of our campaign. Once a year, we do a campaign to raise support from you People like you all around the world, we have no support from any government. The Cuban ambassador a few years ago said that UN Watch is this evil, lucrative organization supported by the CIA and the Mossad. As they say in Israel, halavai, I wish. Um, but actually, well, we don't get any money from any government. Um, and we actually don't wish that, that that was a joke. We don't wish that we did. We are, we are happy to be entirely funded by private individuals like you. And if you want to support us, you can give $5. You can give $18,000 or anything in between, and it will matter. In fact, we're asking, we have well over 100,000 followers on our combined social media. If 
five, uh, if five dollars is given by each of our 100,000 followers, we'll easily make it. We need to raise just over $300,000 in the next 10 days. So please just give five dollars. Tell five of your friends about us so they can give five dollars. And that will help spread the word and will help ensure the continuation of UN Watch's vital activities. Friends, I'm going to see you again on Thursday at 12 noon Eastern time. Please don't forget to submit your questions. You can do so in all the various platforms. There'll be little pop-ups saying, put your question here or email the question uh, as indicated in the captions on our various platforms. Thank you so much for following and thank you to everyone who donated. It really means a lot. We really appreciate your support with um, you know, the, the followers of you and watch the supporters. You are the wind in our sails. So it's thanks to your help that we're able to do the amazing work that the entire global UN Watch team does. And I thank all of our team members who helped uh, make this session happen today and for the amazing work that they do. Thank you for following. See you on Thursday.